Hello and welcome to your Friday. If you're listening on Friday, this is the week that autumn began as well. Equal amounts of light and dark for a minute or a day or how long does that last? And I thank you for listening to the podcast this week. I wonder if you can tell that this is not my normal microphone. I'm having some rain come through the shed on this Thursday night during our hangout, as a matter of fact. And my mixer may be kapunky for at least a moment. I don't know. I'm going to have to put the paddles on it tomorrow and try to figure out what's up. But a great week of podcasts. Thank you very much for all of the amazing feedback this week. A lot of really nice things being said about the quality of the show this week. Maura Quint and Barry Ritholtz on Monday for Maura Mondays. Celeste Headley, people love that. And of course, the legend Rich Louvre. Tuesday, yesterday, we had, or rather Wednesday, Ophira Eisenberg, comedian Ophira Eisenberg and historian Kenneth C. Davis. Yesterday was Tom Nichols for the first time, and Lori Kilmartin was back on the show. And uh, today, of course, I've got Frank Conniff, and it's Friday, so we've got Christian Finnegan. So a great week of shows. Please subscribe. Please sign up now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or standupwithpete.com. And what can I tell you? How you doing? How are you feeling here at the end of the week as we head into autumn and October and harvest and harvest things? Hope you're okay. It was great to hang out last night with so many of you. We really had a fun time. Told stories, shared stories, talked politics, laughed, as always, busted chops. If you have never been to one of those hangouts I highly recommend you join us you gotta be a subscriber and you'll get the email and the link and so been a great week of vitamin N too thanks for all the pictures of nature alright let's get to the interviews Christian Finnegan coming up but first guest who is an old colleague of mine from Sirius XM where I met him while he was co-hosting John Fugelsang's show of course TV's Frank Frank Conniff comedy writer and stand up a comic performer who has won all kinds of awards mystery science 3000 of course is where he was became really well known as he played uh, tv's frank but he's also uh, been a writer producer and actor on all kinds of things including abc's uh, sabrina the teenage witch remember that show he was a writer producer on the drew carey show the new tom green show and so much more. He is he used to work at uh, Air America as well. He provided on-air material, material for Maddow, for Rachel Maddow, for Mark Marion, Liz Winstead, Al Franken, Janine Garofalo. The guy's got so many stories. Such an amazing, impressive career. And uh, I really got to know him at SiriusXM, where we mostly did a lot of hallway talk. I had him on my show a lot, or a few times at least. And I just think he's funny, great, thoughtful curmudgeon of a guy and I, I love 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 talking to him so it was great to get him on the podcast you should listen to his podcast it's a podcast with Frank and Irene as well as the Mads are back and he is awesome on Twitter as well at Frank Conniff's two N's two F's ladies and gentlemen I welcome for the first time ever on a stand up Pete Dominic podcast Frank Conniff Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've got him. TV's Frank, the great Frank Conniff, the first time on the podcast, and I'm very honored that you agreed to join me. Thank you. Hey, great to be here, Pete. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing good, considering everything, the endless pandemic and everything, um, um, despite everything, I'm doing okay. I'm one of the luckier people in in this uh, situation. You had some health scares that you shared publicly. I did. And, and that's another, another uh, sign of uh, luck because uh, it all, it happened like a full year and a half or two years before the pandemic happened. So uh, I had a quadruple bypass surgery, but the uh, ICUs weren't all filled up with unvaccinated people. So, um, or even vaccinated people, you know, uh, so, um, you know, I was able to have I was able to go through that whole medical emergency with uh, being able to be visited by friends, being able to have friends come over to my house and visit me. So, you know, comparatively, it turned out to be a blessing. And, and it all uh, I got great care and, and I'm, I'm much better and I'm doing really good. 
I'm happy to hear that. It was interesting when you <sighs> kind of shared that publicly to see the outpouring of, of support. What did, what was that like? What did that feel like when you told people that you were going in and you were, of course, hilarious about it as you are everything, uh, even, mm-hmm. even though it's a quadruple bypass? Well, how did that how did that feel? It felt great. You know, although I have to say, you know, like I told you, this was like a full two years before the pandemic. Yeah. And, and yet. And yet all of the in my operation, all of my doctors were wearing masks. I mean, what happened to freedom? Come on. Did, yeah, I, I really want to know your thoughts on on that and everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, I want your thoughts on everything in the world. But it is interesting to see who was it recently that put it really well, that they didn't just quite didn't understand the whole mask thing. You can understand mm-hmm. the concerns about vaccines, but why would you be concerned at all about wearing a mask? When you consider um, the history of the world and the struggles of the human race and the things that people have had to endure uh, to get through life, you know, whether it's anything from, from history, uh, the idea that putting a piece of cloth over your nose is this horrible struggle and 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 literally you know i'm not making up people really present themselves as oppressed people who are being put under the boot of fascism because they're asked to wear a piece of cloth over their nose which i've been doing since it started it's it's not it's not comfortable it's nobody likes it but it's but it's it's not this like hardship that i can see you know and then these you know i'm i'm a liberal and we're always portrayed as the snowflakes you know but geez these people who are who are just whining and whining about doing something that not only will uh maybe uh make them safer but make other people safer that you know i mean that's why i feel that like on the one hand all of these people who won't get vaccinated who won't wear masks uh, you know, there's a part of me that's thinking, OK, fine, just go ahead and die if that's what you want. Right. But the, the problem is, is they're harming other people either by infecting other people or by taking up hospital beds. That And, and there are cases now of people who have other medical conditions and aren't able to get care yep. because because the hospitals are filled up, the ICUs are filled up. And it's it's just uh people people have have gone insane what do you how do you connect do you connect any dots between people you know they always say i don't want anybody to tell me what to do i don't want government to tell me what to do don't right. tell me what to do have you know do you do you connect any dots with that type of person who believes that and and then the type of person who is okay with say a donald trump telling them what to do or okay with just authoritarianism in general there's this rejection of being told what to do which is in my mind it has nothing to do with freedom or rejecting authority it's, it has it's something to do with immaturity just you're just immature and at least you know mm-hmm. it, it, it's a lack of of development of confidence and and, and yeah. kind of what what do you think about connecting the dots between those who hate being told what to do about a mask to everything else well, you know, they it's there's they're so childish they should all be treated by pediatricians, it seems like, you know. But I mean the scary thing that we're all going through right now is we're realizing and we're seeing it firsthand of how fascism happens, you know, and people they love a strong some people throughout history and now in America, they love a strong leader and um and they'll do anything Donald Trump uh, tells them to do. They'll think anything Donald Trump tells them to think. And it's it's extremely scary because, you know, we, we, we just had a close call in the last election, you know, when he, he tried to steal it. And, you know, we always thought that fascism was something that happened uh, overseas. But now I, um, it can happen here, which is which I guess it's cheaper. We don't have to travel overseas. We don't have the travel expenses of having to go to a foreign country right, right. to experience fascism. <laughs> Um, we're getting it uh, right here you don't need from it. Donald Trump. And people are literally willing to uh, to die. You know, I'm glad that you're a liberal talk show radio host, not a conservative radio talk show host, because you might not be alive now, because that's the trend now in conservative talk radio is to not is to rant against the vaccine, rant against masks and then die of covid. And I'm glad you're not following that trend. No, I live in a shed.
that's that's good so the it's interesting because you and i have both been paying attention to talk radio and and right-wing media for years Uh, and it's always infuriating to hear them talk about you know promote some horrible policy when they used to talk about policy like trickle-down economics or to be against you know science around climate change or be pro torture or some reprehensible thing that a lot of times they don't even believe, but they say to get ratings to get people fired up. But, mm. but you'd always then, then it wouldn't come true. Whatever prediction they were making about taxes mm. or war, or whatever, it wouldn't come true, but there was never really any consequences because there aren't consequences. All you have to do is get ratings for Rush Limbaugh. Right. And now they're promoting a policy and they are, they believe that policy. They're living by it often. They're not hypocrites. And then they die. It's a really interesting thing to see. Finally there, and they still, the funniest thing is that that comic strip that says, you know, two two gravestones talking to each other, we owned the libs. Right, right. They die. They're dying by their own policy. Yeah, I don't know how having your audience die, uh, how does that help ratings? I mean, the logic of all of this, and as people have pointed out, like the, you know, Tucker Carlson and all those people, they're all fully vaccinated. Uh, Rupert Murdoch was literally the first one online, literally got a vaccination before anyone else. Yeah. And yet they're they're discouraging people. They're discouraging their audience from taking the vaccination. And it's it's a it's a thing I, I almost thought would never happen in this world was a people are Republicans as as much as I always loathe them, the idea that they would be so cynical to let people die, you know, because they think it'll hurt their opponent. And that's what I think is behind this, the whole thing of why Fox News is discouraging people from getting vaccinated is because they know that a recovery from the pandemic means an economic recovery. And that's good for Joe Biden And they don't want anything good to happen for Joe Biden. And I I just never thought I'd see it. But I guess I was naive, you know. Well, let's talk about what you have seen, because you've seen a lot, Uh, Frank. And I want to talk a little bit. You're right. I am old. 19 uh, Wikipedia says 1956 is your year of birth. I just uh, I just turned 65 and I just got my Medicare card, which uh, was, um, you know, I'd rather that be a thing. I'd rather 65 not be that milestone. I'd rather that uh, a Medicare card would be something that everybody could get. But yeah, I'm glad uh, that you've I've seen your tweets about that. And I'm glad that you're tweeting about that. People don't usually talk about aging, much less celebrate a certain age. But 65 Mm -hmm. is an important age in the United States of America. But, Mm -hmm. you know, Medicare is is American is apple pie for Americans 65 and older. But anybody younger, it's socialism. Yes, exactly. And so I'm 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 very happy to be a socialist at at my age. You know, we're uh, socialism and um, and gout and sleep apnea seem to go together. So. (laughs) So. So I, I want to talk a little bit about you and, and, and your uh, life, because you've had a, a fascinating life and career. Uh, but you, you, you're, tell me a little bit about your, your dad. Oh, well, my dad, um, also named Frank Conniff, uh, was, as I say, he was the cool Frank Conniff. He was a journalist uh, in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. He worked for Hearst Newspapers. He he wrote a column for a newspaper in New York, no longer around, called the Journal American, which was a Hearst newspaper. And, you know, he uh, he traveled all over the world. He interviewed every world leader, every American politician. He was he was friends with uh, John F. Kennedy and um, also a lot of show business people. I, that's, I think, one of the reasons I was interested in comedy. I grew up kind of around that uh, Phil Silvers went to my parents' wedding, and um, wow. uh, Jackie Gleason was was friends with my dad. I never I never got to meet him, but uh, so uh, uh, yeah, he was a very um, very much engaged in the current events and cultural things that were happening um, in in post war uh, New York and during World War II. He was a war correspondent. He um, he was. Uh, experienced a lot of combat firsthand and, um, you know, a pretty, pretty, uh, interesting life, I have to say, you know, and, and I, and I go on stage and tell dick jokes. So we're, you know, very, very much uh, on the same level. Is, is he, was he ashamed of you? 
No, he, he died when I was very young, um, but he uh, um, uh, and he was very sick for the last part of his life. But we, so that was actually when he was healthy, he was always uh, out in the world um, and not home a lot. But then when he was sick, he was home all the time. He had a stroke and stuff. So I did. I, we watched a lot of uh, television together and stuff. So he if he were um, around. I think he would have been happy to see the career that I had because he, you know, like I said, he was very much, he very much got it about show business, you know. I'm so happy to hear that. I, I, I'm not, I'm not ignoring anybody else in your family, including your mom. I just didn't, I just, I don't know anything about him. I didn't read anything about him, but your childhood, how would you describe your, your childhood? You grew up in. Uh, Well, it was, I grew up right here. I actually live uh, in Manhattan, a half a block from where I grew up. Wow. On the Upper East Side. And um, it was a very, like a lot of people, like a lot of comedians, a uh, very dysfunctional childhood, um, uh, five kids in the family. And, you know, and my mother, God bless her, she suffered from uh, mental illness when I was a kid. Fortunately, she came through a lot of it and eventually got well. But, uh, you know, so it was just kind of an insane we were all kind of all of us kids were kind of on our own. We didn't have a lot of supervision. So, um, you know, that it, it was just that kind of a crazy childhood. I you've talked uh, a lot about drinking and sobriety uh, yeah. throughout your oh, life. I left that part out <laughs> about how I ended up coming, becoming an alcoholic. Well, I was getting to it. We, I said uh, <laughs> I said childhood. When did you start yeah. drinking? Uh, six years old. No, um, actually, um uh, when I was a teenager, it was pretty much like 14, I would say, was when all that started happening. And, uh, dr- you know, uh, uh, drinking a lot of beer, a lot of pot, and then, you know, any acid and Coke whenever I could get it. I wasn't a big Cokehead because I wasn't ambitious enough to become, you know, you really have to work hard to be a Cokehead. Really? You have to go out and steal and stuff and get the money. And uh, I, I just didn't have that kind of uh, get up and go. To really... <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I mean, I got like 10 minutes left with you, I think. And I I uh, want to I want to talk about so many things. And so mm. uh, I, I don't want to like fast forward. But I just want to I, I do want to ask maybe a couple more questions, at least one more question about the alcoholism and, and, uh, and, and what it what you're sober. You've been sober for like 30 years or something. 30 uh, in, in October. If I make it, it'll be uh, 36 years. Yeah, this, you, this coming. Do you October. think you'll make it? I, I, I usually do. You know, it's, it's just been a blessing that I've been able to stay sober all these years and nothing that, you know, I'm one of those alcoholics. I, I, I couldn't achieve anything. I wasn't a functioning alcoholic. So and all of the good things that have happened to me in my life, in my career and everything, none of it would have happened if I hadn't have stayed sober. And I've always remembered that. So I've managed to um, to do it one day at a time. And let me ask you a, a question I've been wanting to ask somebody, uh, uh, which is if you know someone quit drinking or drugs and they've been, say, say sober for six months or a year. Is it polite or impolite or just subjective to ask them, like, hey, how's your sobriety going? Because I because I know it's you know, this woman in particular is, is struggling and it's been it's been hard and I want to ask about it. But I feel like maybe it's inappropriate to be like, hey, how's, how's your sobriety? What do you do? Um, do you- uh, well, I think if it's someone that you really consider a friend and that they consider you a friend, I think it's it's completely OK to ask that. You know, um, I, I should warn you that, you know, people who are in who are in recovery and are, are really into it. If you ask them that question, you better be ready for a long right. conversation you right. know, because they're used to talking about it all the time. That's part of the therapy right. of recovery is to talk about what you're going through. So, you know, they may talk your ear off. You may regret that you ask them. What, but um, but but like I said, a good like someone who's really a friend, I think it's completely uh, appropriate to ask them that, especially if you're really drunk, you know, because you're looking for stuff to talk about. Right. That's usually the only time I ask people about their struggles when I'm exhibiting them myself. Uh, Yes, exactly. So I I could talk about that forever, but Mm -hmm. I I do want to just get kind of your take on on where we're at today in in this country and and, and what's going on and and what your 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 biggest concerns are, Frank. I mean, well, first of all, I, I ask people on Twitter what I should ask you, and I think it's always fun 
to just ask you about your relationship with Chris Christie. So I do want to ask you that. <laughs> well, I, um, as you know, um, you know, you and I both used to work at a place called Sirius XM. And uh, I was uh, I was asked to leave that organization um, because I said some hurtful things about Chris Christie. Now, I, I, I don't do a lot of Chris Christie fat jokes anymore. People have complained that it's fat shaming and stuff like that. People, <clears throat> uh, when I talk about Chris Christie, they want me to take the high road. But unfortunately, the high road goes over the George Washington Bridge. So it's, it's hard to take that route. <laughs> But I, I did. Uh, uh, but all of the fat jokes I did about him were perfectly fine yeah. and nobody objected. It was when I pointed out that he was a corrupt piece of shit and I didn't like that he was being interviewed. Did you interview him when he was uh, when he was doing his tour? No, the- no. He, he he passed on my show, but he agreed uh, to do your John show that you were a host. Yeah. like like. The thing, the problem was that you you called him a piece of shit while he was on his way up to do your show. Yes. And I specifically and and plus, you know, I mean, I have to admit, I was it, it, this was all like self-induced because um, I tagged Sirius XM in my tweet, too. You know, I said it's um, I, I, I tweeted a picture of the poster that was in the lobby when he was doing right. like every show That's except right. yours on uh, Sirius XM. And I, I said, uh, it's, it's piece of shit Friday at Sirius XM was my tweet. And I, and I tagged Sirius. So I, but, but like I wanted, I really wanted to, to people to know that that was how I feel because that kind of thing is actually very important to me that I don't want to be part of, the mainstream media's intense corruption um, in terms of the way we normalize these people who are just horrible when they're in office and who, who someone like Chris Christie, who just decimates working people and, and is a Trump toady and tries to pretend he isn't a Trump toady, but he is a Trump toady. And I hate the way the media mainstream media normalizes these people And 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 it happens every day on not just on Fox, but it happens on CNN and MSNBC. And uh, and I just I just wanted to make it clear that I'm not a part of that, you know, because I think part of the problem of where we are right now is the media is really what got us here. Um, uh, uh, Trump, uh, things like the Iraq war couldn't have happened without the media's help. And Trump certainly couldn't have happened without the media. The head of CNN, Jeff Zucker, is the person who gave Donald Trump a television show. Um, The Apprentice made him a TV star, saved his career, really. Um, And then when Donald Trump ran for for president, all of the mainstream media outlets gave him unprecedented airtime. They aired his stump speeches in their entirety, which has never been done in the history of American politics was that ever done before? They did it for Trump. Um, and now, you know, they try to talk about what a, um, how horrible he is, but they, they're, they are so complicit in why we are here, why we're here. And um, um, it's something I'm, I feel very strongly about. And so when Chris Christie was on, was on our show, like I, I just, uh, I really uh, brought it on myself that I got in trouble with with. Yeah, I was I was I was really disappointed that you did that because it led to your firing. And right. I just I thought I just uh, like it wasn't worth it. I mean, do you look at it as the ultimate display of integrity or do you have a no. regret? <laughs> I'm in show business. I never display integrity, you know. Well, you do. Uh, now that's funny, but you do. That was that you always did it serious as well. You you know, on the air, off the air, you just that that's who you are. Well, but. I, ex- I express my opinion, and and in most cases, and and you know that John is a great guy, and and we you know John and I would disagree on things, and and we get into arguments, but it was it was it was very respectful and. You know, serious. I felt I was always it was always OK to speak up. I remember when, um, you know, for instance, when Steve Bannon, you probably remember this, he. You know, whatever disaster he was coming out of, he was coming back to Sirius XM yeah. to the Breitbart radio show. Yeah. And you and um, Dino Badala and a lot of people publicly spoke up uh, against that, you yeah. know, just yeah. couldn't. 
you know, so I think everybody has their breaking point of like, I can only put up with so much, you know, if you're going to bring a racist, uh, anti-Semite, authoritarian fascist on and give him his show. I have to say something about it, you know. Well, I I, I appreciate you bring that up, and that yeah, that didn't that didn't do me any favors there as well. I think that uh, was like the first nail in the coffin because it deteriorated mm-hmm. my relationship with executives, which was part of the reason why I had a lot of success there because I had a great relationship with executives. But speaking of integrity, I I I, oh. I do have to uh, do a live read now for bullets and oil, if you mm-hmm. won't if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Well, can, where are you on both those products? Bullets. You know, I uh, my doctors ordered me a- after my heart surgery to not get shot, that it would hurt my recovery. So <laughs> I try to avoid bullets as much as I can. And what about oil, yeah. the the fossil fuel? How well, do you? Um, I, you know... Uh, you know, I live in New York where people are fracking every day. You know? <laughs> and also I have to I also have to promote covid. Where are you on that? Well, so far, um, I'm 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 very lucky. I haven't I haven't gotten it. I've been very careful about getting it. But you know what? I did a show. Uh, have you been getting out and doing stand up shows? Not at all? A, hardly at all. I've done a few, yeah. very few. I yeah, purposely have I've not been slowly. <clears throat> and I, I did a show at. This great club in Brooklyn, you're probably aware of Little Fields. And I did, I did it a few weeks ago, and it was it was the night of that Hurricane Ida came to town. Oh, and and it's it's and to me, not only you know, I mean, I went out and a, a certain amount, you know, they they had good protocols there for checking if people were vaccinated, but 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 it it, it was really indicative to me of how unprepared we are for climate change because. That show never should have happened, not just because I was in it, but also because um, <laughs> there was, a, you know, we, we underestimate climate change. And new, no and no, no one in New York said, hey, don't go out yeah. tonight. Everybody shut down tonight. It's, right. it's going to be really everybody went out just as if it was going to be just a rainstorm, you know. And I was lucky that I, you know, that I had the resources to take an Uber. I barely made it home if I if I. If the subway had been my plan, I never would have gotten home that night. Yeah, you, I'd still be there doing comedy, which would have been a tragedy for Brooklyn. I mean, people, it, you're absolutely right. A lot, that's why a lot of people died or got injured and, and, and a lot of, you know, first responders get put in harm's way in that case because they're trying to save people. But you went out to get, a, you know, a six pack or a, a tampon or whatever one thing that people go out to get mm-hmm. that they weren't planning. And then you ended up floating home. I mean, it's yeah. Yeah, scary as was, hell. you know, so we're, we're, we're you know, uh, as you know, on, on speaking of oil, you know, which is a, a cause of a lot of climate change, we're just not we're still in denial about it. You know, that was just a good example of of yeah. the people just being in denial. You know, what do you think of what the Republican Party has has become? You've been covering talking about politics most of your life and career. You've seen it all going from, you know, uh Bush one to to Clinton to right. Bush, you know, to, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Obama and then now uh, Trump and, and and Biden. But, you know, the Republican Party has just gotten so, so extreme. And now they're the Republican Party of, of Alex Jones, not Sean Hannity. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's I, I think where the Republican Party is, is a very natural progression of where they've always been. Um you know, Richard Nixon, when he ran for president uh, in 1968, um, a, a big part of his strategy was was the Southern strategy. It was embracing racism as a way to get ahead in politics. And, you know, he if you read the book Nixon Land uh, by, by Rick Perlstein, they talk yeah. about how he, you know, when Ronald Reagan ran for governor of California in 1966, Nobody took him seriously. You know, he was considered kind of a joke. Uh, But Richard Nixon, who was planning to run for president, he did take it seriously. And he did pander to Reagan's audience, which was already a very anti people of color audience. And so that kind of strain of the Republican Party has been there at least since then, certainly before then, too. And then you know, Nix, uh, uh, Reagan, when he was elected president, that was just um, kind of everybody going all in on white supremacy because, it, you know, he wasn't as crude as Trump, but his policies were very much white supremacist policies. And, and it's just been that way ever since. And Trump, 
it's just the crudest version of, of something that's been around for a long time. So, uh, but so you, I'm, I'm not a Republican is my point. <laughs> yeah. I get, how do you explain the, you know, for, put, putting racism aside, the, the kind of, you know, the, the huge strain of Trump supporters who believe in all kinds of crazy, insane QAnon conspiracy theories. I mean, I don't know what percentage of it it, it is of them, but it's, it's frighteningly large and growing because they also show up at all these BOE meetings. And I know the most extreme ones are also the most loud ones, but the, the when, extreme ones, though, are the ones in political power, though. All, you know, all of the Republican Party is an extreme party. There's no such thing as a moderate Republican, yeah. even someone who I might call a, a, a moderate Republican like Joe Manchin or Christian Cinema. They're in the Democratic yeah. Party, but right. they really are more moderate Republicans, but they're not even that moderate as Republicans. So right. there, there's there's no such thing as a moderate Republican. It, it's all an extremist. Uh, it's a it's a death cult, as people have called it. Yeah, it, it's it's really scary. And, and that's another problem with the media, because they can they don't say that about them. They continue to normalize them. Yep. They continue to present things as well. Democrats believe this, but Republican, you know, Republicans believe in white supremacy. But on the other hand, here's what other people think. You know, they they yeah. I don't know as a person. I don't know how I'm supposed to meet people halfway on on ra- on racism, you know, on an, on an issue like Confederate statues. Like there's uh, there's no there's no meeting people halfway. There's only take them down, I feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, they have their own living monuments to racism that they can worship. They don't need, they don't need the statues exactly. anymore. All right. I know you got to go do another podcast, but I'm really psyched to I talk know, to you. Let's I'm, call this part one. I'm so busy. I, I'm, my, my career is on fire. What can I tell you? Two I, podcasts in one day. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, <laughs> so let's do it again when you don't have uh, a, another podcast due and we'll do part two and pick up where we left off right here. Frank, so great to have you joining me for the first time and i hope that you'll come back soon yeah please have me back i'd love to i'd love to thank you so much all right frank conniff how about it everybody go let him know that you heard him here on the show on twitter i think you'll see that and appreciate it that's at frank conniff to ends to f's check him out check out his podcast all that information is in the show notes. And now it's time to get to my second guest here on the fifth and final show of the week. And that is, of course, Christian Finnegan, because he joins me every Friday. It's almost every Friday, so I can cut him into it. So TGIF, ladies and gentlemen, comedian, cultural commentator, the always amazing and becoming better and better friends, Christian Finnegan on Twitter, at Christ Finnegan. And here's the uh, the opening jingle that Pico wrote for him. Lost in brooding sentimentality, it's Finnegan Fridays. Sigh. Okay. Okay, Christian. I press record. We are officially off. And uh, thank you for the last 15 minutes. Some, some good talking, some good personal advice. You're a good friend. I appreciate it. Some real guy on guy commiseration going on. Yeah, some real sharing about things just like guys deal with, you know, guy stuff. Fella stuff. Yeah. You know, our man, like some of our manly issues that we struggle with. It's good to go to another guy and be like, hey, you ever have this? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's true. I mean, I, you know, it's a cliche, but uh, it is probably not the standard thing that a lot of dudes do. But I think it is something that would help most men is to just you know, to commiserate and to sort of uh, share middle-aged dude type experiences. I, I, I do get a little insecure. Somebody might think I'm a beta. Yeah. Oh, I've, I accept. I'm not even a beta. I, I don't know. I'm not an Omega. I, I'm an Omega. I'm the final iteration of you man. just lie down and let people walk up on you. That's what that is. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the hell I am. Um, my dad knows the Greek alphabet. He could tell me some middle tier Greek. Alphabet what's letter. more, what's actually more difficult than confronting your demons? What's more manly than going to the worst things in your life and parts of your life and being like, you know what? I'm going to deal with that so that I can be the man that my family needs me to be, that my partner needs me to be. That's 
that's tough. And that's why I'm going to deal with that manly. How do we, how do we, you do know, it? there's a, there's an Elvis Costello album, uh, which was named after, uh, I guess, an Irish song called uh, mighty like a rose, which, uh, I've always loved as a title, uh, especially in my pretentious poet warrior days, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I like the idea of it's like, I am strong enough to be vulnerable. I am strong enough to be crushable, you know, that, that, that there is a strength and being uh, openly weak in a way, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. uh, that there's, you know, I'm sure that the sort of alpha male type dudes wouldn't acknowledge that <laughs> variety of strength, but that there is uh, there's something very admirable about people who are uh, open enough to admit that they're vulnerable. Absolutely. I think, and I think that could be described as manly. I always think about the veterans issue and let's say you're the most elite military member, which meant you saw a lot of crazy combat stuff and you probably lost people that were like brothers to you. Well, you're tough enough to do that, to be in a firefight, to jump out of a helicopter, to take another life, but you're not tough enough to deal with that when you get home and that, you know, because and I almost want to spin it that way because that that that's what I'm just repeating myself earlier. But that's what breaks men. That's why people take their lives because they they're unable to deal with that. Now, that's dismissing people who take their lives and tried everything. So I'm sorry. I don't I don't mean to dismiss anybody at all. But I do think that you can often get better if you'll confront that shit. Well, yeah, there's there's a compartmentalization that is required uh, to do certain things yeah. in in life, especially in sort of traditional, traditionally male roles like warfare and, yeah. you know, being a soldier and, and things like that. And, you know, uh, when you're in Fallujah is maybe not the time to be mighty like a rose. <laughs> like it's that's maybe not the time to be vulnerable. It's like you have to compartmentalize. And that is totally understandable and necessary. And, um, but as you then return to civilian life. And as, as life goes on. And I think that certainly when men get to a certain age, when the testosterone stops being the prime motivating force, but, but behind every thought and action, um, these other feelings come up. And if you've been compartmentalizing your entire life, if you sort of walled yourself off from any sort of tenderness and emotion, that that the the cognitive dissonance can can break a lot of dudes, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, for sure. By the way, if I said anything when I was bumbling through that that uh, was off, I'm sorry. Please let me know. But yeah, suicide is very tough to talk about because you want to include every single element of it. So I wanted to ask you this question today. I, I've been thinking about this all week. I wanted to talk about it with someone. I was like, I'm going to talk with Christian about that, which is like, will we ever have another two term president or will, will it continuously be hard for anybody to be successful with the nature of frankly video and social media? Because looking at Joe Biden, it's like every week has been a really hard week for him for the past several weeks. And a lot of it has been because of imagery out of Afghanistan. And now these Haitian people being whipped by the border police and, and, and your good deeds, the best things like cutting child poverty in half, there's no image of a child <laughs> not struggling with poverty going viral. And so it seems it's not necessarily Biden. It's, it's anybody, it's any, it's any politician. It's almost anybody in, pu in public, uh, you know, it just feels like it's going to be harder to, spin that you're doing a good job if every bad thing goes viral yeah i mean that, that is certainly true and um you know it's been it's been a, a a tough few weeks i suppose i think our politics are going to have to change the sort of radical pendulum swing and i don't say have to like in terms of we need to make them change i think mm -hmm. they will change as a result of sort of the radical pendulum swings of virality you know that some crazy thing becomes everything everyone's talking about for a few days. But sometimes I feel like the outrage of things lingers for a shorter period of time. 
as a result of virality, that there's always a new thing right. bubbling up. Right. And, you know, like the Afghanistan thing, which the, the bad parts of Afghanistan, the bad parts of the bad parts of the Afghanistan withdrawal are already starting to recede from consciousness. You can say that's a good thing or a bad thing, but they are, <laughs> they're being replaced by yeah. new outrages. And, uh, that thing that used to take place every six months now it takes place every six days. Right. Uh, just because of the, the cycle it spins quicker now. Um, I don't know what that means in terms of, uh, you know, long-term thing. I do try to remind myself that as, as tough as things seem right now, I remember how tough everything seemed during the Obamacare debate, just like how just grinding and brutal that was and how every day was a piece of bad news Hmm. for, uh, you know, what's the idiot, the, the Senator from Lieberman, Nebraska, Bacchus, no, uh, not Bacchus, uh, the oh. dude with the really plastic looking hair. He was a democratic Senator from Nebraska, but him and Blanche Lincoln and like all of those sort of, you know, they've now been replaced by cinema and mansion. And, you know, there's, there always seem to be those couple of Democrats who yeah. define themselves by not actually being Democrats, but you know, four years is a long time and there's really just no way of knowing. And I would say that if this is as bad as it gets for Biden, mm. then I actually still like his chance. I actually like his chances. You know, you're, I, I do. As you're talking there, it made me think about the other thing that's kind of happening is I absolutely think they're going to pass this 3.5 trillion. from everything I've read, there's just so much posturing going on and I'm watching Bernie Sanders and he's never been better. If people are paying attention to him, I don't know. I don't know if he's cutting through, but he's like, we're taking on all these big special and we're going to lower drug prices with this bill. And meanwhile, cinema's holding up. She's getting almost a million bucks from pharma. It looks so bad for her and so good. And I think that if, if it passes, it's going to be a major, major thing, uh, improvement in a lot of people's lives and all the wonky political scientists I talked to about this said the best thing you can do is make people's lives better and have that them attribute it to you and who knows if it will but I think people will see what this does in their community this kind of money and and in their lives maybe maybe not but I'm feeling more hopeful about that this week you know I I agree with you I I hope that that is true and uh I've actually been very frustrated and disappointed with the so-called liberal liberal media the last couple days because they keep having these just mendacious liars on like Josh Gottheimer from uh, New Jersey. You know, the, the ones who who caused all the stink a month ago about uh, not wanting about wanting to pass the the moderate bipartisan. Democrats or the conservative yeah, yeah. Democrats. The quote unquote moderate. They're, first of all, they're not moderate. They're they're, they're corporate. Yeah. And, Good. you know, but there's this narrative that everyone has bought into, including MSNBC and the like, that. Anytime there's fighting in the Democratic Party, it's the progressive wing that is causing the problems. And if they would just go along with the herd, then everything would be fine. That is not true. It's the progressive wing that is fighting for what Joe Biden publicly said he want. He publicly had a press conference saying that if the bipartisan bill came to his desk without the uh, the reconciliation bill, that he wouldn't sign it. That 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 these are meant to be paired together, and that is what you know. Every you know, uh, Premier Jayapal, uh, AOC, they're the ones who have dealt with this in good faith and honestly, and with flexibility and dignity. And it's the Chris and Cinemas of the world, the Josh Kottheimers of the world. Uh, they are the ones who have been you know dishonest, and straight the, up dishonest. Yeah, and your point in, of- in the media. I'm sorry, I, I was listening to Jeff Bennett on MSNBC yesterday. Uh, let Josh Gottheimer just give his fucking talking points and then be like, you know, the important thing is the Democrats come together. Right. And, and, you know, progressives aren't going to get what they want or whatever. And it's like, they're the ones fighting for what Biden says he'd like, not the Josh Gottheimers of the world. And, and it really frustrates me that they're being let off the hook on this. I all great points. And I, I, especially the media point, you can find out how every one of these policy proposals in this bill polls with your constituents it's all overwhelmingly positive and to the media point on sunday's face the nation margaret brennan had uh, bernie sanders on and she's like are you going to bend from 3.5 trillion and bernie's like what you're not the, you're not even the, uh, we already did it was six trillion we went to 3.5 and it's like she should have framed it that way they've yeah. all he's already cut three three whatever it is trillion dollars from it 
already he's compromised yeah. a bunch and they act like he's being intransigent. And that really uh, outraged me. You're- and it, it, it annoyed me. Sli- or, you know, I understand why it happened, but it was frustrating that that Schumer and Pelosi and a lot of the sort of leadership really were touting the three point five billion because it implied like, look at all the big things we're doing. Look how big we're going. But as a result, now it's got this sort of albatrossy sound to it when it's like nobody ever mentions it's 3.5 trillion for the entire agenda over 10 years like that is everything like everything is being swept up into this bill now and so it, it really isn't particularly radical if you you know comb it out over 10 years and you understand the the lengths to which this uh this plan goes it, you know I, I i think that it will get passed i do I don't think it'll end up being 3.5. Mm-hmm. I think that the the pound of flesh that the mansions and the Godheimers of the world, that they've now kind of put themselves out here, that they can't purely for optics sake, can't sign on to 3.5. So it'll come down to 2.9 or 2.8 or, or something like that. But I my hope is that eventually, you know, it, I think it'll happen like Obamacare, that it'll be ground into something yeah. where no one's happy about it. Yeah. And it'll be a net positive, but just barely. <laughs> that's my that's my prediction at this point. Well, you sold Obamacare a little short because a lot of people are happy about it. But I'm saying at the time, it was yep. like, obviously, Obamacare, when they passed it, the Democrats were happy and relieved and it was a big fucking deal, as Biden said or whatever. Yep. But, you know, there wasn't the public option. There wasn't yep. there weren't all these things that were originally you're, intended. To be you're right to say, like, look at how much we fought and how much we compromised and how much we lost. And that really is a bitter pill to swallow when you know you could be really close, if not for one or two people or in this case. The filibuster, which is so frustrating because just because the vast, vast majority of Americans want these things and we can't get them done because a very a much smaller minority of Americans don't. So what do you think about <laughs> because of a minority of Americans and also the fact that I'm you know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and to say that the the cinemas and the mansions or whatever that in their minds, they are. Uh, holding the center, but they're not holding the center. They're holding the center because the people they hear from on a regular basis are corporate lobbyists right. and they don't represent any large swaths of people at all. And uh, corporate- as you said, the policies are all, they pull 60 to 80% depending, yep. you know, they're all radically popular, yep. but yep. in their minds, they have this, this idea that it's like, whatever the progressives want, I have to hedge off of that to sort of keep my brand as a quote unquote centrist want to ask you about another story this week. And I guess this is not the hill I want to die on, but I've made this point this week and I'm going to make it tonight uh, when I've got some black folks in the room. So it's just about this, this girl who died, who went missing apparently Mm -hmm. that they found and everybody's having this reaction that it's, you know, beginning a lot of coverage because it's a blonde white girl. And I've already said, of course it's, it's, you know, pretty white girls are always going to get more coverage in situations like this. And, but this is a girl who was well known on YouTube that people followed her every week living in a van. We all have these people that are, that we follow them on YouTube or wherever it, it, you know, it, or they have a popular podcast or something. That's, I think why it's getting so much more attention. And Yet I'm still I'm not upset that people are making this point that that's, you know, it's because she's white. I think it's true. It's a fine point. But it's also because she was a pretty big YouTuber. Yeah, I I think that is that is definitely true. I mean, I know for me, I had never heard of this person until she disappeared. And so I felt kind of duty bound to not give a shit in a way. Yeah, because I I, because of those exact same reasons that it's like there's a, you know, a, a black woman to disappear. There's an Asian woman, you know, like that. I'm not going to all of a sudden get involved in the story, but you know, someone brought up, it may have been, it may have been Chris Hayes. I don't know. It may have been somebody I was following on Twitter. There was a discussion that, that it's like, this is what people are talking about. The media was actually behind on this. You know, the, the media didn't create this story. This was a big deal on TikTok and on social media. And the media is kind of just following the, you know, the, the scent essentially. Um, And so, you know, at a certain point, you have to blame people. It's not just it's not the media deciding that not in, at least in this case, it's not the media deciding from on high that we're going to care about this white girl and not the various people of color who have disappeared. 
it's that people on social media have kind of become obsessed with the story and the media is kind of playing catch up with it. Um, people you are know, obsessed. The most popular podcasts in the country for years have been true crime. The shows on TV, true crime. People love that. This was happening in real time. A person that they followed went missing. Everybody was talking about this person is who's in a van is gone missing. And it became, you know, a story because of that. I just, yeah, I mean, I, I think I that just, people think because, you know, it, even if you see two hours of footage a day of someone's life that they share in social media, there's still 22 hours you're not seeing, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it feels like people are constantly present on social media, yeah. but the truth is even the most obsessive social media, you know, TikToker or YouTuber or whatever, there's still half of their lives that you're not privy to. And sometimes the reality crashes in against the sort of what they're presenting to the public. And that dissonance is fascinating on some level. I mean, I, I, I get it, but I just feel on a personal level, I feel duty bound to not give a shit because I didn't give a shit before. Yeah, I the same, the same. Uh, I guess I'm just saying if, if someone was living a public life and if they were indigenous or black or Asian it, and they went missing, it would have been a big deal to their fans. Yeah, I mean, and, and you can say that, well, you know, I, I, I hope that a I don't want there to be a test case on this, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I'm sure there are. Uh, I'm not aware of who the big YouTubers are or TikTokers are black, white, Asian, whomever. I don't know who those celebrities are in that weird little world um, or that not little weird, big world. Um, but I hope that we never have a test case to find yeah. out whether that's true. Well, pretty, I mean, pretty white girls are always going to get a lot more attention. It's a sad truth about our country and our media. I'm not saying that's not the case. I'm just trying to be more specific about that well, one. And if and, people haven't seen, you know, I'm sorry, the, the Patrice O'Neill bit that I'm sure has been making the rounds the past oh, couple of weeks yeah, that, uh, about Jordan Vandersloot or, you know, uh, it's Natalie Holloway. It's it's fucking great, you know, and you should watch it because you know, Patrice O'Neill is a guy who's a fantastic comic, not not one of my favorite people as a human being, right. but uh, a f- really fucking great comic. And his special elephant in the room is quite good. But he has a bit specifically about this phenomenon that he really lets the audience hang themselves on their own rope. And it's, it's fun to watch. If it's not a copyright vi- violation, I'll try to tag the end of our conversation with it. Last question, though, for you this week is, do you know what it was in reference to this tweet? I thought it was interesting. I was like, I wonder what he means. And I, and I was like, I'm going to definitely ask him about that. You wrote, uh, do people understand that the stuff they post here on Twitter counts? Like in terms of how you're assessed in real life? Yeah, man. Sorry I didn't stop to chat, but I can, you know, read what what is what happened. Is this subtweeting? It, well, I mean, not subtweeting. It was based on an interaction that I had had a few weeks ago. And so I kind of my the way I do things is that I if I have something that I'm not sure about or if I feel like it's going to come across as passive aggressive, because I just I don't use social media to wage personal battles. It's just not the way I want to use it. It's not the way I want to live my life. It makes me crazy. Like when I do have a kind of controversial tweet that goes viral and then people are getting upset about it, like it it dominates my life. And that's what makes me feel like I am not made for the social media generation because Mm. I don't find it pleasant at all. If something I write goes viral, if it's a joke, sure. But jokes don't go viral anymore. Only shit talking. That's the only thing that goes viral in in this generation. Uh, The days of sort of writing a funny tweet about guacamole and having it have 20,000 likes, those days are over. I you don't know. I had one. About somebody. I had a guacamole tweet get pretty big this week. You must have not seen it. Anyway, go I ahead. must not. I'm sorry, I didn't didn't crack my my bubble. <laughs> uh, but um, but it was kind of based on an interaction that I had had with somebody who you know was kind of offended or, or was curious that I hadn't uh, been properly friendly in oh, real life. Man. And you know, and this is someone who I've always gotten along with in real life. Nothing personal about it. And it wasn't, I, I didn't post that as like a fuck you to that person, but it's just sort of a phenomenon. It's like, do, do people understand that this all counts? That, that people seem to have this idea that they can sort of silo off this insanity to social media and that it doesn't, it, it doesn't count somehow, that it doesn't go into the, uh, the audit of who you are as a human being. It all fucking counts. 
you know, and the, the thing I've always said to people is that if you could, and I may have said this on the podcast, so I apologize if I'm being redundant. I realize I'm very old for having this point of view, but if someone could weird science, a human being, like if a human being could be created a la the movie, weird science based purely on what you post on social media, that's the only information that anyone had. Like I'm Dr. Frankenstein, 21st century, Dr. Frankenstein, and I'm making a human being. And all I have is what you post on social media. Would you hang out with that person? <laughs> and if the answer is no, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? What are you? Because I'm sorry. I can't just bump into you in real life. And because you were, you held a door for me once, or we shared a cab a couple times or you were friendly to me in real life, I'm not going to ignore that you're a complete fucking psychopath on social media. I'm That's sorry. Great. It's so great. Uh, <laughs> lastly, I just wanted to, I know I said last Saturday, but uh, last week you recommended a song and it was mm. apparently really effective. One listener, James B, who's very funny, said, listen, just thinking maybe not let Christian pick the songs for the end of the show anymore because I'm afraid... The theme Schindler's List may be next this week. He was apparently he was depressed by your. By it was your yeah. It was a bit of a a maudlin, a bit a bit of a maybe, maybe it's a, not a great way to end the podcast. No. So I did actually think like, what's a fun song oh, that I could okay. end tonight today's podcast with if you if you want it? Yeah, um, what do you got? And just arbitrarily, um, I don't know if any of your uh, listeners are familiar with the Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, wider cinematic universe. Uh, the, uh, there's a, a song called uh, by Parliament called "Unfunky UFO," which to me is a song that is impossible to not smile while you're listening to, to not be happy. And it's it's a it's a narrative tale about a, a a man who gets abducted by space aliens, an alien race who is lacking in funk, and so they want to somehow uh, with like a probe remove his funk so that their people can uh can partake of the funk and it's a it's a it's a great song and it's a makes me always makes me happy whenever i hear it christian thank you as always pal i love you i really appreciate Thanks, you Stand up. all right christian finnegan at christ finnegan and i can't pull the audio for that song because my mixer's not working plus could be copyright issues I got flagged a couple times I've done that. That's why I'm so happy that we've got John Carroll who wrote and gave this song to us, but you can go support him. And the links to John Carroll are in every day's show notes. Thanks to Pete Coe, as always, for a great week of voiceovers. Thank you to everybody who supports this show, the paid subscription. If you don't, you're a cheap fuck. Let's go. It's five bucks a month minimum, and you can always pay more. So go to standupwithpete.com and do yourself a favor and me a favor and It'll, 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 everybody will be better for it in the end. I promise you. Thank you, guys. I love you. You're the best. I'll see you on the Discord platform if you're a stand-up community member. And uh, talk to you a million other ways as well. I hope you have an awesome weekend. Thanks for your listening and support and love. And I will now say goodbye. Bye-bye. Take us away, John Carroll. Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand